Somebody turn the lights off. Praise the Lord. Appreciate the youth choir singing this morning. I'm glad because he lives. Remember, you come right on. Children's church uh, kids, you come right on this morning. All these little children, praise the Lord, going to sing for us. Amen. <laughs> praise the Lord for the little ones. Praise the Lord for those who work with them too. Amen. What a blessing. Yes. Amen. Y'all sing it out, kids. Same time. Amen. Appreciate the children singing this morning. What a blessing. All right, the uh, teens are going to sing now. I think Brother Jonathan's coming. He's going to say something about this song he's going to sing. And so the teen class, y'all come right on this morning. They're going to sing for us as well. So in uh, Sunday school, we've been going through the book of Judges, and we got to Judges chapter 4, and um, uh, it was a, in Judges, it's a lot of rep repetition, um, the children of Israel turn away from God, and um, there's a judge, God sends a judge to deliver them, and in chapter 4, it's, uh, he sends Deborah along with Barak, and uh, he delivers them from Sisera, and in chapter 5, uh, this Deborah and Barak sing a song, and the song is praising uh, God for uh, his most recent victory as well as uh, victories in the past, and that got me to thinking, uh, I'm a school teacher by trade, and I thought, you know, what's something that we can do to show God our appreciation for everything he's done in our lives and the things that he's going to do for us uh, that are to come? So I challenged uh, these uh, group of teens to uh, write a song. Now, if anybody knows anything about me, I'm not musically inclined at all. Uh, so I relied very heavily on uh, their knowledge and their skill set, and there are a, a few people that I'd like to thank. First of all, Brother Brad, he came down uh, one Sunday morning uh, to help us, and um, he was, a, he was a, good, a big help to us. But uh, Brother Ethan, Lacey, um, my wife, um, and also Isabella, uh, she's a poet and didn't know it. Uh, but uh, she, uh, she wrote most of our lyrics, and, and we changed it, we had input. But the very first thing we did was I got a, a big whiteboard, and we wrote down everything that we were thankful for. And um, it was, that was a blessing, just the, the brainstorming piece to hear what all these children are thankful for and, and what God's done for them in their lives. And, and they wrote this song, and uh, they wrote the music to it. So um, this is something that, uh, that's theirs, and um, it's really indicative of their relationship uh, with our Savior. So uh, I hope it's a help to you.
Back around, get settled down, and get ready for the preaching. A wonderful, wonderful time of singing. I appreciate the youth choir singing and the little children singing, always fun. And the teenagers, they just outdone themselves today, did a remarkable job singing. I appreciate all of that. It's our privilege to have with us today Brother Ricky Cothram. He's done a tremendous job preaching in our sunrise service this morning. And we're really looking forward to having him preach for us again here in our 11 o'clock service. I, I do want to mention this for those of you who are uh, expecting Brother Dean Powers to be here to preach for us. He is very ill. Please pray for him if you will. He's been sick for an extended period of time and he just can't seem to get any better. And so please remember him in prayer if you will. Uh, but we, we have not let down on the preaching one bit. And Brother Ricky did an excellent job this morning. And we're very thankful to have him with us, and we're excited that he's going to be preaching for us again uh, in our 11 o'clock service. So you give him your attention this morning. May the Lord speak to you through his word. Brother Ricky, thank you very much. Pastor. Amen. All right, it's good to be here again this morning. Pastor told me not to worry about time, so I've changed my message. I'm, we're going to be here a long time. I'm going to preach on the sins of T.J. Bing. And uh, we'll be here for days. I, I'm kidding about that. Amen. Uh, he likes to aggravate me. I pick on him too. Uh, boy, I appreciate everything that's been done this morning. I uh, appreciate the Lord being in, this, in the sunrise service this morning. Amen. Amen. And don't tell me the Lord can't come around early in the morning. That's fine with me. Uh, then I appreciate the good meal and the people that prepared it. And uh, I thank God for you that did that. Amen. I thank you, folks. God is going to give you a special assignment. I think you're going to cook in the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. You say you're going to eat in heaven. Well, I'm going to be there. Amen. And uh, I appreciate then, then the service this morning, all the singing. And, and then, of course, uh, you that are here and then the visitors. And I, this church has got something that you just don't see in a lot of churches. And I, I'm in a lot of churches. Um, and you don't see. Uh, I had a, a fellow tell me this uh, Friday. A young man was doing some work for me. And he was telling me, he said, you know, there's just no young people in our church. And you young people, you're the future of this thing. And you need to get a hold of the Bible. You need to get a hold of the Word of God at a young age. I don't care how old you are. If you're 8 or 10 year old, 15 year old, get your Bible and read it every day. Yes, sir. Now you say, preacher, young people can't understand the Bible. That's a lie of the devil. Right. Uh, when I got saved at 11, I started reading my Bible. And uh, God will use you if you'll do that. Amen. And I thank you again, Brother Crotch, for letting me come. And I hate the man you had scheduled is, is sick. I'll pray for him myself, Brother Powers. I don't know him, but uh, I know this. He's my brother. I'm saved. He's saved. So uh, I appreciate it. I, I'm not him. I'm not anybody else but me. But I'm going to try to help you from the Word of God this morning. If you take your Bibles and open them with me again to the book of Revelation, chapter number 1. I want to go back to where we were this morning, and I'll recap a little bit for those of you who might not have been here in the 8 o'clock service. And uh, I love preaching the Bible. I'm in my 40th year. I'm not much of a preacher, but I'll say this to you. I don't know of anything I'd rather be than a preacher of the Bible and the Word of God. And uh, God called me to do that. Now, not everybody can do that. There are certain people God will not call. God will not call the unqualified. God will not call ladies. God will not... By the way, you ladies have a great part in the service of the Lord. But to be a God-called preacher is a special privilege. But it's also a special burden that you have to have. And, uh, you know, and, and there's good and bad. But I thank God for the good years that God has given me. Now, Revelation chapter number 1. I don't want to waste time. I know it's valuable. We're going we're gonna to go. But I do want to give you some things. I want to read this verse again. Verse number 17 and 18 that I read this morning. This is Jesus talking to John on the Isle of Patmos. He's getting ready to give him the Revelation, which we have here, the book of Revelation. And he says this to him verse 17. John says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Now verse 18 is what I'm focusing in on. I am he that liveth. And that first statement has to do with life. We studied that this morning in the 8 o'clock service, the source of life and the satisfaction of life. The second statement, And was dead. He's not dead now, but he was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell 
and of death. Father, would you help us as we look into the Word of God this day? In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I told you this morning Jesus made four statements out of this verse. Number one, He said, I am He that liveth. That deals with life, and we dealt with that this morning. Now, I want to say again, He lives. He's not a figment of our imagination, but He lives. Nobody ever changed the world like Jesus Christ. Now, the TV and the movie crowd and the Hollywood crowd would have you believe that He was some dope-smoking hippie that went around doing good. That ain't our Lord. Uh, He lives. He's holy. He's high. He's on the throne of heaven this morning. Amen. And then the second statement he made, and was dead. That has to do with death. And there had to be a death. There had to be, and I'll show you that in a few minutes. The third statement, I am alive forevermore, that has to do with the resurrection. And I won't be able to deal with that statement today, but the the fourth statement is, he has the keys of hell and of death. That's the statement of victory. Now I want to deal uh, today, this, in this service, we dealt with the statement this morning, I am he that liveth, and we talked about life. But I want to deal with that statement, and was dead. And I want to deal with that, speaking to you on this subject, the living God. But I want to talk about the death of the living God. Now God died an unusual death uh, in the fact that uh, God's the only one, Jesus Christ is the only one that ever died when He chose to die. You see, He laid down His life. They didn't kill Him. He died of His own. He yielded up the ghost. He gave up the the ghost. He died, but He had to die. He used the illustration in the Gospels as a a seed of corn is put in the ground. It's got to die before it comes up. Now, some of you are gardeners, and I am, and some of you are, and this year you'll plant your corn in the ground. And that corn's got to die in the ground before it comes up and makes corn. Uh, There's nothing really pretty about a corn seed. You just put it in the ground. You don't think much about it. But thank God about August to July, you're going to think a lot about it when it comes up and you get to go there and pull the ears of corn off. And there's always more corn than there was seed. Now by the Lord dying, amen, by the Lord dying, then we all got in. So I want to deal with that death this morning. I've got about three or four things I want to give you and I have to move fast. Number one, I want to talk about, when we talk about the death this morning, we want to see the sin. You see, there's a reason why the Lord had to die. It wasn't His sin. No, sir, for He never sinned. Now, I may not be as lively in this part of it. My wife said, you won't be shouting, preaching on death. And uh, no, but but you wait till the end of it. Just hold on now. We ain't at the end of the tunnel yet. But I want to show you some things about His death. First of all, I want to show you the sin was there. There was sin that entered in the world. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, and I literally believe what the Bible says, I believe they literally ate fruit, that God told them not to. As a matter of fact, the little kids held the key to it, uh, obedience. The reason they got in trouble, they disobeyed God. And when you, get, when you disobey God, it's sin. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And so they disobeyed God. In the garden they disobeyed. So sin was there. Let me just read a verse to you this morning. Now you bear with my reading. I don't like to read a lot, but I'm going to have to today. Romans 5, 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world... And death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. All right, sin was there. There's there's only one way to get rid of sin. Now, the first uh, thing that happened was Jesus, well, the first thing happened, Adam tried to cover his uh, self with the fig leaves. And then the Lord made coats of skins. But wait a minute, that didn't take away the sin. And then Moses came along with the law, and that still didn't take away sin. Sin. Sin was there. Now, I want to show you something. You don't have to turn, but just, you can write these down and read them when you get home, all right? Psalm 32, 1 says this, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Now, I want you to notice that. Now, I'm going to say something this morning. Don't let it rock your boat, what I'm going to say to you. And if you disagree with me, it's all right, but I want to show you something. When you cover something, it's still there. Now, the law covered sin. You see, every year the priest would go behind that temple veil. I don't know about the tabernacle veil, but the temple veil was 60 foot long, 30 foot wide, thick as a man's hand, and it took 300 priests to hang that veil. And the priest would go behind that veil every year and offer a sacrifice. It was good for one year. But the sin was still there. It was covered, but it was still there. 
Now, the word covered literally in this verse of Psalm 32 is it's an interesting word, but it means gathering or harvest. And that's exactly what happened every year. Their sins were gathered and covered. Basically, they were covered. I say, preacher, is that about it? The law covered sin. Up until Jesus Christ, the Bible said that the law came by Moses. The grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. He had to die for our sin. I'm going to show you that I'm going somewhere in just a minute, but I'm going back to the law. I'm going to show you something. The law covered our sin. Now, many uh, Old Testament writers made statements about sin. I wanted to show you some of them, and I don't have time to dwell on them. Job said this. He said, My transgression is sealed up in a bag, and thou sowest up mine iniquity. Now, wait a minute. Is Job's sin gone? No, sir. It's sewed up in a bag. Now, if your sin's in a bag, well, it's not gone. You understand? The law covered sin. That's the best they could do was a bull or a goat or whatever, a blood offering. That's the best they could do. But his sin was sealed up. Now, let me show you something else. Isaiah said this, and I, and, uh, or excuse me, Hezekiah said this in Isaiah 38, 17. He said, for the whole peace, uh, he said, behold, for peace... I had great bitterness. But thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. He's talking about death. For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Now wait a minute, Hezekiah. Are your sins gone? No, sir. They're still there. God cast them behind his back. What do he cover? The sin is there. De Jesus had to die because of the sin that's in the world. Jesus had to die because of the sin of mankind. The law could never take away sin. If the law could take away sin, then Job would have been uh, justified with his sins sewed up in a bag and, and Hezekiah with his sins behind his back. Now let me show you this. Psalm 103, verse number 12. Now don't let this rock your boat, but I want to show you something. He said, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Well, wait a minute. Are they gone? No, sir. If I start right now and go due east, you know where I'll go? A complete circle around the earth. And I'll meet those sins again somewhere. Now the law put them as far away as it could. Now I know we sing songs and I'm not going to pick songs. For if you do, you won't sing anything. Because you've got to remember, God inspired the Bible. Man wrote songs. Okay? So if, if we start eliminating a lot of our songs at the radio, we won't have anything to play. Amen. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, but we sing songs like my sins in the sea are, are as far as gone as the east is the west. And that's okay. If you sing that I'm not mad, I sing that too. But technically in the New Testament, that's not true. And I'm going to show you that in just a minute. The sin was still there. You see, that Jesus had to die because of sin. Now let me show you this. In Micah chapter number 7, verse number 19, He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will uh, subdue our iniquities. And thou wilt... Pray for me. The page is sticking together. Amen. Uh, and boy, the devil don't like that. Uh, it's all right. And I, and I cast all their sin into the depths of the sea. Now, many people shout on that, and that's okay. I'm not mad about that. But my sins are not in the depth of the sea this morning. You say, my sin's in the sea of forgetfulness. Mine ain't. If they're in the sea, somebody go fishing for them. Now, wait a minute, That's all, that, and they, we, don't, we don't do away with the Old Testament. It's been fulfilled. Now, let me show you the fulfillment of the sin was there. You see, I'm talking about the death, uh, his death. He said well, he was dead. Why did he have to die? Because of sin. He had to die because of sin. All right, the sin was there, but now the sin's been taken away. John chapter 1, verse number 29. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now there's a new uh, thing coming. There's something new. There's some better thing for us. Our sins are not covered, but thank God they're taken away. Why? Because of his death. He had to die because of Adam's sin. One man sinned, sin entered the world, but this one man died to save the world. You see what I'm saying this morning? I hope you all still with me. You understand? He, but Jesus said in the book of Revelation, and was dead. He's not dead now. But he was dead. Why did he have to die? Because of sin, you see. Now, now, my sins are taken away. They're not covered anymore. You see, we live in a dispensation that we ought to be excited about. We live in a dispensation that Moses and David and Job and, and Hezekiah and Micah would have loved to have lived in our day. They only had their sins covered in that day. But we have ours taken away. 
There is no veil. There is no high priest going in there. I can go the same place he went. I can go boldly to the throne of grace and say, God, I need your help this morning. Amen. Uh, when, when, and, and I can go to God by, uh, because, why? Because Jesus died. He was dead. He had to die because of sin. But not only, not only the sin, I want you to notice, secondly, the sacrifice. There had to be a sacrifice, you see. Now, what, what did God say here about that? He said this. Uh, he said uh, that uh, in uh, the book of... He, in, uh, first of all, I want you to notice there had to be a body. You see, Hebrews chapter number 10, verse 5 says, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. But a body hast thou prepared me. Now, by the way, Jesus Christ was 100% God and 100% man. Now, I'll say it again. We've watched so much TV, and Hollywood has brought out so many movies. About, I don't I need to, I hope, you, I hope it don't offend you, but I, I don't need to see a movie about Jesus dying on the cross. All I got to do is read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Gospels, amen? And they'll tell me everything I need to know. You know why? You know why? Because he was dead. He had to die because there had to be a sacrifice. There had to be a body. You see, a, a goat or a bull couldn't do for me, but there had to be a real body. He gave his body for you and me. He literally suffered for you and me. If you want to read the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ, read Psalm 22. And read Isaiah 53, how he suffered. And I tell you, no man ever suffered like him. They, the Romans would crucify uh, the, the victims in threes. And they would put the vilest offender in the middle. Well, you see that man on the... Uh, and we always suppose the man that went to hell was on the left hand. And I, I kind of believe the Bible indicates that. It don't come out and say that. But let's just say for, for that sake it, that this man over here, he, he goes to hell, he's dying in his sin. And this man over here, he's dying from his sin. He gets saved on the cross. But that one in the middle was supposed to be the vilest offender. By the way, they would put on the top of the cross on the subscription over their head what they did, thief or murder or whatever. But when they came to Jesus, they couldn't find anything negative to write. And Pilate wrote, uh, King of the Jews. And the Jews went to him. They didn't like that. And they said, don't write that. Right, he said he was the king of the Jews. And Pilate said, what I have written, I have written. So Jesus stood there uncondemned, really, and he's dying for sin. Amen. Why did he have to die? For sin. Well, then we see the sacrifice. We see the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. There had to be a body, you understand. All right, now, secondly in that, let me say this, with this sacrifice, there had to be the blood. There had to be the blood. In Hebrews chapter number 9, verse number 24, let me read this to you. The Bible said, For Christ is not entered into uh, the holy place made with hands. And you pray for me again. My page is sticking together. I guess that means I didn't go over this like I should have. Amen. All right, I know what I'm doing. I just got my pages all sticking together. Which are the figures of the true but into heaven. Now watch itself. Now to appear in the presence of God for us. You know what? He didn't go to a man-made tabernacle or a man-made temple. He went into heaven and put that blood on the mercy seat for you and I that we might be forgiven. While the law covered the sin, Jesus took the sin away. He had to die. There had to be a, a, because of sin. He had to die. There was a sacrifice. There's the body and there's the blood. Let me say this morning, I want to thank God for the blood. We're living in an hour when our churches and our religious leaders seemingly are going away from the blood. And they're inventing ways for men to get saved. The contemporary church movement is teaching baptism as a way to heaven. You've heard the old saying, I'll tell you here again, you can be baptized so many times that the tadpoles can read through your wallet and know your social security number and die and go to hell without God. My friend, you only get saved by the blood. Amen. The blood of Christ. Why? He said, I, he was dead. Why did he die? Because he had to shed his blood for you and me. Verse number 25 says, Nor yet that he should often uh, offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. The Bible said in verse 26, For then must he have uh, suffered uh, since the foundation of the world. The Bible said, but now once in the end of the world, once hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. How about that? Amen. Let me say this to you. He said in Revelation 1.18 again, 
and was dead. He died because of sin. Sin was there, but sin was taken away. He died as a sacrifice. He gave His body and He gave His blood. Now let me show you 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. For as much as you know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. That's false redemption and false deity. Amen. This whole world. He said, the Bible said from your vain conversations, what's this received by tradition of your fathers? We're all born sinners. But verse 19 says, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now that word precious is an interesting word, but it means costly. It means valuable. Now the songwriter didn't mean any harm when he said it should have been me, but it shouldn't have been me. My blood wasn't sufficient. It took one person's blood, and that's God. And that's why he penned in the Bible and was dead. He had to come. You see, there couldn't be a resurrection without a death. He had to die first. Now, the death's not pretty, and the death is not nice, and the death don't get us shouting. But let me say this to you. There had to be a death. You've got to understand that. And I believe this. We were talking about it before the service this morning about you know, getting people to serve the Lord. In these days, it's hard to find people that will commit to serve the Lord. But I believe this. I believe people will serve the Lord when they begin to realize what the Lord did for them. And if you don't realize what Jesus did for you on the cross, then you're not going to serve well. You see, the more you study Calvary and the more you study the sufferings of Christ, the more you're going to realize what He did for you. Not that you're repaying Him, but you want to do something for Him. How will you stand in the judgment seat of Christ as a born-again believer? You won't be judged for your sin, but you'll be judged for your time, your talent, your treasure, your testimony. And you're going to be judged for it. And how in the world can you stand there and say, I've done nothing for the Lord after He went to Calvary, shed His blood, suffered, and died for you? How in the world could you not do something for Him? My friend, this morning I'm glad God's let me for 40 years preach the Word of God. Up and down this country on radio, preach to people I'll never meet and never know where they are, never know who's listed. But I say this to you this morning, that God's been gracious to all of us. But listen, the, on this Resurrection Sunday, we ought to think about what God has done for us. And we ought to think about how He suffered and how He died on the cross. And when we think about that, when we think about His death, it'll make us want to do something for God. It'll make you sing better when you're thinking about the death of Christ. You see, a lot of times we sing the songs and we don't really think about what they're saying. But, 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 but listen, when we begin to think about the songs and what they're saying, that'll make you sing better. When you begin to think about it, you'll teach Sunday school better. You'll preach better. Everything you do will be better. Why? Because you're doing it for Him. We serve a risen Lord who was dead. He's not dead now. I'm going to show you that in a minute. Amen. He's not, I'm not going to close out with death, so don't get excited. Amen. Uh, you say, boy, you killed the service. No, just hang on a minute. Amen. I'm going to show you something here in a minute. I'm, I'm not going to do that. But I'm just telling you, he's our sacrifice. He offered his body. He offered his blood. Now, I've got to tell you, I really don't think I would have uh, given my... I, I love all of you, but I, I just don't know if I'd give my life for anybody. I might could my wife, but they'd have to do it quick. Before I had a chance to think about it, amen? I might get bold if somebody's going to shoot her and say, I'll take your bullet, but they better do it quick. If they didn't, I might back out and shove her out front, amen? I don't know. <laughs> Look, I'm just being honest, amen? I know. You say, would she take a bullet for you? I doubt it, but anyway, I don't know. Amen. <laughs> she probably would, but anyway, here's it. Long walk home, boy. But, uh, <clears throat> long walk. Nobody in here knows where I live but TJ. I live 200 miles here. No. But anyway, here's the thing about that. Did you know that Jesus did something for us nobody else ever did? And here's the thing about it. He did shed His blood for us. Yes, Any of you ever been down to the jail and ministered in the prisons and the jails? Well, you see some of the vilest people in the jails. Some of the most wicked people in the jails and the prisons. I have been face to face with murderers and and all, all kinds of people in jail. And, and you, you just think about that. God died for them. Yes. I was thinking about it as they were singing that song this morning about the leaders sleeping in their graves and they're going to stand before God. I don't know why, but Adolf Hitler popped in my mind. And I just thought about him. Killed over six million Jews. Now that was an awful thing. Yes. World War II was an awful time. I wasn't here. Some of you probably were here during that time. I wasn't here during that time. But it's an awful period in our country's history. It's an awful period in the world's history. 
But can I tell you that if Hitler would have bowed his head in sincerity and asked God to save him, do you know that God shed his blood for that murderer and God would have saved him? Can I tell you God would save the vilest sinner and set him free? Why? Because he had to die. Because sin was there. But sin's been taken away. And brother, there had to be a sacrifice. There had to be the body. There had to be the blood. It wasn't a goat or a pig. Uh, I mean a, 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 a cow or a, a, a calf or a, or a sheep. It, it could never take away. Could never take away sin. But let me tell you what, Jesus had to have a body. And he had to be in the image of God. And he came. And then he had to shed his blood. And brother, he didn't spill his blood. That would be an accident if he spilt his blood. But he shed his blood. Amen for you and me. Well, you see, he, he said, and was dead. Now let me show you something else though. I, if I ended right there, that would be a sad message. And that would be a sad message. But let, let, me, let me give you the third thing. He said... He said, and behold, I am alive forevermore and was dead. All right, we see the sin and we see the sacrifice, but there's one more thing about that death we need to see. We need to see, and this is what we're here for today, we need to see Sunday morning. You see, if you miss Sunday morning at Calvary, you've missed it. You see, we talk about Calvary, but let me tell you, if there was no resurrection, there'd be no salvation. You understand that? You see, he didn't just die, but he got up. That next phrase he said, and behold, that word means stop, pay attention, look at in Revelation 1.18. And behold, I am alive forevermore. You ever thought about this? He's alive. Because he's alive, we got a, we, we, we're alive. Because he's alive, we got a Bible that lives. Because he's alive, we got a church that lives. Amen. Everything he touches is alive, ladies and gentlemen. You see, you see, Calvary was sad. Calvary was awful. But I like Sunday morning, don't you? Let me just notice a few things about that and then we'll go home. First of all, I want you to notice the word about Sunday morning. You see, he had told his disciples a long time before, but they just couldn't get a hold of the resurrection. They just couldn't understand that there was going to be a resurrection. You see, I like that part, the way Jesus phrased it in the Bible, and was dead. He ain't dead now. And by the way, if you want to go to the tomb, it's fine with me if you want to go over there. I think I'm just going, and, and I know the preacher said he's preaching in Israel, and I'm not, I'm not saying anything against that. I'd, I, I guess I'd be scared to go over there right now, but I'd probably go. But I'll say this, I don't have to spend $3,000 to go over there and look in the tomb because I'm going to be over there in the millennial reign anyhow, and I know he ain't there. He's on the throne, amen? I don't have to see the tomb, no, he's not there. Somebody said, I went to Israel and saw the tomb. I know he's not there. Well, I didn't go. I got saved, and the Holy Ghost told me he wasn't there, amen? You know why? Because yes, he died. Yes, he suffered. Yes, they crucified him, but Sunday morning came. Now, he warned his disciples or told them in, in uh, Matthew chapter number 20, even before the cross, this is what Jesus said to his disciples. He said this to them. Verse 18, he said, Behold, he said, We go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priest and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death. Verse number 19 says, And shall deliver him... Uh, to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. Now, if his disciples have been paying attention right there, there was the word about Sunday morning. He was dead. He couldn't stay dead. He's the only person that ever couldn't stay dead. You understand that? I mean, listen, the dead couldn't stay dead in his presence either. You know, remember when he went out to raise Lazarus from the grave? You remember what he said? He said, Lazarus, come forth. Do you know why he called him by name? If he had not used the word Lazarus, if he had just said, come forth, every saint that had ever died would have come out of those graves. You know why? Because he told Martha, and Martha said, I know that I'm going to see him again in the resurrection. He looked at Martha and said, I am the resurrection. Amen. He is the resurrection. And so, so because Sunday morning, the word about Sunday morning. But then I want you to notice something else about it. I want you to notice the women of Sunday morning. Notice this in Mark 16, 1. The Bible said that when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James uh, and Salome uh, had uh, brought uh, sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. Now, these women were preparing to anoint him. They just didn't get a hold of it. And they're worrying about, in John, I believe it is, they're worrying about who's going to roll the stone away. Well, when they got there, the stone was already rolled away. You see, they were, they were looking for him to be in the grave. There wasn't any need for those spices. He wasn't there, brother. He had already got up. You understand what I'm saying? And a lot of the world today, they don't mind you talking about the crucifixion. 
They don't mind making a movie about, about him dying or, or something like that. But let me tell you, very few of them talk about the resurrection. I know we're on video, but I'll say it anyway. The Muslim and the Christian walked along together in the desert. And the Muslim said to the Christian, he said, you know, Islam and Christianity are alike. And the Christian said, how so, sir? And he said to him, he said, well, you take Muhammad. He said, Muhammad was born for his people. And the Christian said, so was Jesus Christ. And the Muslim said, Muhammad lived for his people. And the Christian said, so did Jesus Christ. And the Muslim said, Muhammad died for his people. And the Christian said, so did Jesus Christ. And silence filled the desert air. And the Christian looked at the Muslim and said, well, go on. He said, that's all. He said, you don't understand, sir. Christ arose for his people. Amen. Sunday morning came. Yes, death came, but Sunday morning came. He was dead and was dead. I like that past tense, and was dead. You see, the world today would like to have a dead Savior in a dead tomb somewhere. They like to look at Jesus as some kind of prophet. Brother, he was more than a prophet. He was prophet, priest, and king. Amen. About to get excited. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, let me show you something else. Let me show you the wonders that happened. There's, there's just a few things. There's a few things happened on that Sunday morning. Amen. After the death. Verse number 2 in uh, Matthew 28 says this, And behold, stop, pay attention every time you see that word. There was a great earthquake. That represented the power of God. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. You know what that represented? Victory and power. Uh, and by the way, the Bible said the keepers, uh, they became his dead men. They didn't know what, they, what to do. Amen. Verse number 3 says, His countenance was like lightning. That's the glory of God. And his raiment was white as snow. That represents the purity of heaven. And for fear of him, the keepers fell, uh, excuse me, did shake and become as dead men. You know what happened on that resurrection morning? There was some wonders. To, by the way, there was an earthquake when Jesus died. And there was an earthquake when he rose. And keep in mind again, Revelation 1, 18. Behold, uh, he said, I am he that liveth and was dead. He's not dead now. We're looking at the death. He's not dead now. Amen. Sunday morning came. And that's this Sunday morning. That's Resurrection Sunday. I know it comes at a different time every year, but we, we, uh, we recognize that this day as the Lord's Day. Amen. I'm going to say more about that in just a minute. But there were some wonders there at Calvary that day. By the way, that was God showing the world. By the way, two is the number of witness. And God was showing the world by those earthquakes that, uh, hey, He died. Yes, He died. And every devil in hell was rejoicing. But they wasn't rejoicing too big come Sunday morning. Amen. I'm not making fun of the devil, but you might have found him somewhere over there in the, uh, in the side ditch moaning and the groaning. Or maybe some of the demons were, and the devil might have come down through there and said, Hey, boys, what happened? They said, Well, I'm sorry, Satan. We couldn't hold him. We tried. If we could just hold him one more day till the corruption got here, it'd been okay. But we couldn't. He got up this morning. Amen. I'm glad he got up, ain't you? Oh, yes, this morning. Listen, I'm going to tell you this this morning. Did you know, again, I go back to that verse in the book of Corinthians. Paul said, if we uh, had hope in this world, uh, 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 we'd be of all men most miserable. If that's all the hope you had was, was just living. I've heard people say this, Brother Crotz. They said, well, if I could just live the Christian life and then die, I'd still be worth it all. No. No, I disagree with that. Because I'll tell you why. The Christian life is some battles and valleys sometimes. To be honest with you, sometimes the world enjoys more pleasures in this old world than the Christian does. I mean, they enjoy riches. They enjoy fame. They enjoy... But this world's not my home, you see. I'm not put here to enjoy this world as far as this world's concerned. I'm put here to enjoy life, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to eat watermelon and ice cream and eggs and bacon and gravy and biscuits. Thank God. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm not a Jew, therefore I can eat bacon. Amen. By the way, if they're saved, they can too. Amen. Paul said you eat all things. But, I, but I'm just simply telling you, I'm going to enjoy life, but I don't enjoy this whole world. Why? Because I wasn't put here to enjoy the world. After I got saved, something changed on the inside of me. But you see, because of Sunday one, he was dead. He's not dead now. He got up. You see, there was, there was the wonders. And then I want to show you something else here. And then I want to show you, and this is the last thing I want to show you. 
I want to show you about this day. You see, Jesus was dead. He did die. But Sunday morning, if you don't put Sunday morning with death, you see, you're going to have a dead Savior. Brother, I don't have a dead Savior. I've got a living Savior. Let me show you one more thing, the worship. Now, have you noticed something under the Old Testament of the Mosaical Law, and even going back to the book of Genesis, there was something called the Sabbath. That was the seventh day. That was Saturday. Now, if you do this, I'm not mad at you. You, th- you say, boy, preacher, you're you picking fights. No, sir. But I've heard people pray in church, and they'll say, Lord, bless this Sabbath day. Well, this ain't Sabbath day. I don't worship God on the Sabbath day. That's on Saturday. I leave that to some other religious organization to do that. I, I don't worship God on that. That's mean. But, but I, uh, we worship Him on Sunday. You see, when Jesus died and He rose again, the first day of the week became important. Sure. This is God's day. Yeah. This is not only resurrection day, but John called it the Lord's day. Yeah. Can I just preach a little bit and say this? Sure. Today ain't family day. Yeah. I hear a lot of people say, well, Sunday's family day. Wrong day. Right. If you want to have Saturday's family day, fine. But Sunday's worshiping day. Yeah. I got saved in 1978. When I was in 70, 1975, my mama got saved. In our house, we didn't know anything but drinking, cussing, fighting, begging, betting on car race. I'd betting on car race at eight years old. I was winning money. But let me tell you something, buddy. Well, I had enough sense to know Richard Petty was winning everything in 75. I don't know why. Daddy and uh, his, his buddies couldn't figure that out. They're grown men. I was nine years old listening to the radio. I said, well, he's the one winning. I'm going to bet on that guy. But brother, when I got saved, things changed. And there was something, when my mama got saved in 75, there was something different about Sunday, ladies and gentlemen. Guess what I did? I started going to church on Sunday morning. Well, you ain't going to believe this, but I started going on Sunday night. And you ain't even going to believe this, but I started going on Wednesday night. And I started going to revival meetings and camp meetings and Bible conferences. And guess what I've been doing for the last 46 years? Sunday morning, uh, Sunday night, Wednesday night, whenever you have it, you ought to be there. Amen. Hey, I just whenever you have it. I don't reckon there's no set time to have it, but whenever you have it, you need to be there. Amen. And you know what? I just make a rule. You say, well, I just, things come up. You know what I did? I made a rule. They don't nothing come up on Sunday morning. I'm going to church. They don't nothing come up on Sunday, and I'm going to church. They don't nothing come up on Wednesday night, I'm going to, I don't let it come up. Amen. You know why? This is the Lord's day. This is Sunday. This is the day after the death. Amen. Yes, he died, but thank God for Sunday morning. It's the Lord's day. And by the way, it's the day of worship. You know what happened in John 20, the first resurrection Sunday? Right here's what happened, verse number 19. The Bible said, then the same day at evening, then the first day of the week, the Bible said, uh, where did I go here? It may be in the first day, be in the first day of the week when the doors were shut, for the Bible said when the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. Watch this. Came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Now wait a minute. What did Jesus say in the book of Revelation? Where's he at compared to the seven churches? He said, I'm in the midst. Where was he there? He's in the midst of them. Amen. You know what he did? They're sitting there. They're mooning. They're mourning. They don't understand things. And Jesus comes and appears to them the first resurrection Sunday. How about that? Amen. Don't you like to be at church when Jesus shows up? Amen. Oh, yes, he died and was dead. But now listen. If you're hanging out, by the way, I believe we ought to preach the cross, and I believe we ought to preach the death, but you can't preach the death without preaching the resurrection. Amen. If you preach the death without the resurrection, you see, that's where other gods stop. Yes, sir. Even old Mr., and I know we're on video, probably not be saying this, but even Mr. Pope's going to die one day, and he's going to find out he's not infallible, invincible, or anything else. Amen. But I'll tell you one thing, Jesus Christ is, Brother, he, he, he died sinless. He arose sinless. Amen. And brother, what did he rise for? That we might worship God. Now I'm going to say this. You see, this is resurrection day, but this is the Lord's day. And then this is that because he died, we can have this day. We couldn't have this day if he hadn't died. We'd still have been worshiping God on the Sabbath day. But you see, because he died, we have a new day. And let me say this to you. We're never going to have revival in America. We never will. We'll never see this nation turn to God. Man, your pastor was talking about this morning. I'm just going to say this. It's not politics that's going to turn this nation around. It ain't a man in a movement. Now, I believe you ought to vote right and stand right and do all that stuff. But I'm going to tell you, preaching this book and seeing people get saved and seeing people get convicted of their sin and seeing people get sorry of their sin and repent, that's what's going to change America. But we'll never have a revival in America until we start reverencing the Lord's Day again. I tell you, this is a holy day of God. 
Amen. This is God's day. This is the day we come that we meet together. Now, you can worship God on other days. It don't matter if you have Bible conference on Tuesday morning. You, you can have as good time on Tuesday morning as you can on Sunday. But there's something about Sunday, ain't it? There's something about this day. You know what? It's made for what? It's Sunday after, after Calvary. It's resurrection day. It's the, you, you ever thought about this? Under the Sabbath, that's the seventh day. Seven in the Bible is the number of completion. You completed the week, you rest. But think about something. Sunday, resurrection day is the first day of the week. You know what Jesus is? He's the first fruits. And so he's the first. And brother, he's now in his rightful place. He came to take away the sin. You see, he was dead. He's not dead now. And brother, you know know what we ought to do every Sunday? We ought to meet in our churches across America and let everybody know he's alive. Jesus lives. He's not some figment of my imagination. He's not some little song that I sing. He lives. He's inside me. He talks to me every day. I've talked to him. I've been in, now I have not been in touch with Washington since I've been here. I've got to hurry and get home, call the president, and make sure everything's okay. I've not been in touch with the governor since I've been here. Uh, but I tell you what I have done. I've talked to heaven three or four times since I've been here this morning. And by the way, God's alive and well. You know why? Because he talked back to me. Amen. You say, preacher, you're crazy. No, sir. I'm telling you this morning, we serve the living God. He lives. Amen. Let me show you this last thing. I want to show you this. John was exiled on the Isle of Patmos. And that's where he got the revelation. But I want to show you what John said in Revelation chapter 1 verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Not the day of the Lord. Now the day of the Lord and the Lord's day is two different days. Okay, don't get that mixed up in the Bible. He said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And heard behind me a great voice. As uh, the Bible said, as of the, uh, well, that whole thing didn't, oh yeah, there it is. As of a trumpet talking on me, amen. Or as of a trumpet, let me read that right. I like to read the Bible right, don't you? I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. That's what it said. Now let me tell you something. You know what? You know what John did? The trumpet in the Bible is a type of the Word of God. You know what John heard? The Word on the Lord's day. That's why you ought to be here at Barrettville Baptist Church on the Lord's Day. You say, preacher, I just, I just, I'm, I'm hungry in my spiritual life. Well, you need to be here and hear Brother Cox preach the Word of God. He does something a lot of preachers don't do, and I really like this. A lot of some preachers are doing it more now, and I think it's needed more now. Uh, taking books and just going through them and preaching messages, and that way you learn scripture that you ordinarily would not go through. Well, let me get back to this, and I'm closing. I want to tie this together in just a minute. In Revelation chapter one verse eighteen, he said, "I am He that liveth." And was dead. Yes, he died. He died. But thank God there's Sunday morning after the death. Amen. He did die. There had to be because of sin. He died because there had to be a sacrifice. There had to be something better than a, than a calf or a sheep. But thank God it was Jesus Christ. And now he lives. You can go away today understanding on this resurrection Sunday that you serve a living Lord. And when this world closes in on you, And you have problems and troubles that flood your life. You realize that God, the creator of this world, the resurrected Savior, is right there to take care of your problems. You know what? You really ain't got any problems all the way to glory. All you got to do is lean and trust on Him. The Bible said He's never going to put anything on you that you can't bear. And so you know what you ought to do? Just sit back, relax, and trust Him all the way like riding in an airplane. Uh, If you've ever flew, I never have. I don't think flying is scriptural. The Bible said, lo, I'm with thee all the way, right? That's a stretch of the scripture. <laughs> I'll never flew there. I, I'll have to fly one day. I know I will probably. But, uh, but you, you know, it, it, and Brother Cross could tell you this. If you're in an airplane and you're flying, you are in total trust of that pilot in the front of that plane. If you're sitting back there, you have no control. If that plane's doing this, it's jumping up and down your heads and bobbing up and down like y'all was this morning, going up and down. You say, preacher, you wasn't doing that. Why? I'm too old to do that. Amen. Plus, I got on my hands and knees planting onions yesterday. I might have got up, but I couldn't have got back down if I did it that fast. Some of y'all would do it. That fellow in front of me right there, buddy, I tell you what, he, he was getting on with it. Amen. He going up and down. like That's good. But, but you, you know what I'm saying to you is this. That if you're in an airplane, that plane can do anything. You got no control. But you know, when you got saved, it's sort of the same thing. Praise God, your pilot's in the front. And by the way, Jesus ain't no co-pilot either. He's the pilot. He's the one got the controls. And by the way, you know what he told the disciples? He said, get in the ship. We're going To the other side. Now your ship can't sink if you go on the other side. You see, they looked at death as a bad thing. 
When, when, when he died on the cross, Peter and John, they misunderstood everything and they thought that was the end of it. Those two on the, uh, on the road to Emmaus, and I was going to preach on that day, that's my second thought and the Lord didn't let me go there. But, but they thought they couldn't understand things. And remember Jesus appeared to them on the road to Emmaus and, and, and he said, what, 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 what are you talking about? They said, if you, are you only a stranger in Jerusalem and you don't know what's happened here? Of course, Jesus started to expound to them all the way through the Old Testament Scriptures. That's all they had. And preached Jesus Christ to them. Amen. And they understood. What I'm saying to you is this. He's a resurrected Savior. Yes, He had to die. But thank God He does. And I want to say this final thing. I don't know, but in a crowd this size, I don't take for granted a people's salvation. Friend, if you don't know the Lord today, you must be saved. You must accept this resurrected Savior. You say, preacher, I've heard you preach and that sounds like a fairy tale. Well, it, 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 let me tell you something. It's more true than your movies are. It's more true than your book, your fiction books are. It's more true. Jesus Christ is truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, I'm not mad at you if you read or, or what you do, but I'm just simply telling you, Jesus Christ is real. He's real and He's truth. And listen, if you're not saved, you need to be saved on this, on this day. Not to make a big splash on Resurrection Day or Easter Day, but so you'll go to heaven. You see, friend, because He died for your sin and He's extended mercy and grace, the day of grace will not be forever. One day there will be a judgment. And as it is appointed unto man wants to die, but after this the judgment, that means two different things to two classes of people. The saved, we're headed for the judgment seat of Christ. The unsaved, you're headed for the white throne judgment, which will be a thousand seven years after the judgment seat. And you're going to be judged for every sin you ever committed. You're not even going to have a lawyer or an advocate on that day. I know what it's like to stand in the courtroom and the clerk of court look at me and say, Mr. Cothran, can you give me one legal reason why you can win this case? My lawyer wasn't there that day. And I lost that case. You know why? Because I couldn't give that clerk a legal reason because I didn't know the law. I want to tell you something. You know what? I couldn't defend for myself either, but Jesus is the lawgiver. And brother, let me tell you what, he took my sin away. He didn't just cover it. It's gone. Well, I know the message may be a little scattered. It may not turn out the way I kind of want it to. But let me say what I'm trying to say is this. If you're lost without the Lord, you need to be saved. You need to come to the Lord today. See, you don't have the promise of tomorrow. There's somebody in this room right here. You may not be here next Resurrection Sunday. You may not be here. You may not be here. But let me tell you what, I know that I'm saved. I know that I'm saved and I'm so sure of it. I could swing out over hell on a rotten rope and spit in the devil's eye. It wouldn't bother me because I'm going to heaven. I ask you in, a, in this, and I'm going to close and probably let the pastor do the invitation, but I'm going to ask you a question. Would you come? You say, preacher, there ain't no way into heaven. I'd walk down there in front of that crowd and get saved. I'm going to tell you something. That's pride. You better lay that down and get saved this morning. Trust God. What a wonderful thing it will be to trust the risen Savior. I live in victory every day that I live knowing that I've got a God. You see, I'm not so worried about the news in this old world, but I keep up with the news that's in heaven. You say, but preacher, our world's getting bad. You're right. But I didn't come here to stay always, friend. I'm going. And you know what? Jesus could come today. I'm going to close out in prayer. Father, I do not feel like I've done a good job with this. I tried to do what you asked me to do here. But Lord, I pray this day that you would help us to understand that you was dead. You're not dead now. You was dead. Lord, but you live. You said, Behold, I'm alive forevermore. And Lord, as the pastor said early this morning when we first started, because you live, we can live. I'm going to be in heaven in eternity because of you, Lord. And I pray this morning you'd help somebody to make that choice themselves. In Jesus' wonderful name, the pastor's coming. God bless you.